live NFL trivia every Wednesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge for a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. One of the most important things that any announcer has to do in order to resonate with the viewer is establish credibility. In a nutshell, it means you have to sound like you know what you're talking about. If you say that the linebacker blew the coverage when he really didn't, and when he actually performed his assignment perfectly, or if you say that a player is having a good season when anyone who follows the team closely knows that he isn't, in a snap, the viewing audience will turn on you. They won't trust any word that you say from that point on, because you've lost that credibility, and you got something emphatically wrong that could have been disproven fairly easily if you knew what you were doing. And speaking of losing credibility, that's exactly what happened to one NFL announcer working for NBC in the 1980s. This is Reggie Rucker, and in the blink of an eye, he went from a rising star in the industry and someone who was working his way up the ranks on the announcer depth chart to a man remembered for an infamous statement on the air, and to a man whose career never recovered. On paper, it seemed like a silly white lie, but in actuality, it destroyed his reputation forever. And this is the story behind one of the worst announcing moments in NFL history on NBC. Before I talk about the moment in question, we need some context to understand who the announcer is, and why his comments caused such an uproar in the first place. And to fully understand who Reggie Rucker is, we have to talk about what he was doing before he was a color commentator in the NFL. Like most color commentators, Rucker began his career as a player. Even though Rucker was undrafted out of Boston University, he found his way into the league, and had an incredibly solid career lasting more than a decade. While he bounced around the Cowboys and Giants to start off, it was in New England as a member of the Patriots that he would find his footing. During the 1973 season, he was one of the best receivers in the AFC, finishing with 53 receptions, which ranked 6th in the NFL and 3rd in the conference, and 743 receiving yards, which ranked 8th in the NFL and 3rd in the conference. In fact, during the 1973 season, if you looked at every player in the AFC with at least 50 receptions and 700 receiving yards, Rucker is the only player that meets those criteria. Eventually, Rucker would find his way onto the Cleveland Browns in 1975, and would play seven seasons there. While with Cleveland, he was an instrumental part of the team's offense, particularly during the 1980 season, when quarterback Ryan Seip won MVP and guided the team to the postseason. Seip loved throwing to Rucker, as that year, Rucker finished second on the team with 52 receptions and 768 yards. By the time Rucker's playing career came to an end, he was one of the greatest receivers in the history of the Browns, as in his seven seasons with the team, he racked up 310 receptions for 4,953 yards and 32 touchdowns. If you looked at every player in Browns history at the time to have at least 300 receptions and 30 receiving touchdowns, by the end of 1981, the list consisted of Hall of Famer Dante Lavelli, Hall of Famer Max Speedy, All-1960s team member Gary Collins, and Reggie Rucker. That's it. He was in rather historic company. However, father time is undefeated, and all great careers must come to an end at some point. After a disappointing 1981 season where he posted just 27 receptions for 532 yards and one touchdown, all career lows since joining the Browns, he announced his retirement. Rucker could have stayed on as a backup receiver, but he didn't want to do that. The soon-to-be 35-year-old receiver knew he had little left to give to the game that he loved, especially after a back injury in 1981. As Rucker said while tearing up, the time has come to move on. I don't like being second banana to anyone. Head coach Sam Rutigliano held Rucker in high regard, saying that he would miss him not only as an athlete, but as a person, calling him the most prepared player he's ever been around, and calling him classy and dignified like Joe DiMaggio. But it was time for Rucker to do something else. And that something else? Broadcasting. Just based off what Rutigliano said about Rucker in that farewell press conference, it's not too much of a surprise that Rucker would be a natural fit in the broadcasting world when it came to announcing games. A big part of being a good broadcaster is that mental preparation when it comes to doing your research beforehand and it only took one year for Rucker to find his way on NBC's team, as beginning in 1983, Rucker would call quite a few games for the network. Back then, outside of the top three broadcasting teams, NBC would have a rotating cast of characters, and Rucker would work some games alongside the likes of Jay Randolph and Phil Stone. The state of announcing wasn't great back then, as you had a ton of color commentators who offered no insight, were blatantly biased, interjected at times when they weren't supposed to, or a combination of all three. Here is one article from New York Magazine that just goes to town on a ton of the announcing teams from 1983. It criticizes Hank Strand for being impossible to decipher, criticizes the Monday Night Football team for having too many talking heads, criticizes Bob Costas for not keeping track of the game, criticizes Bob Trumpy and John Brody for talking too much, and criticizes a lot of the color commentators for being indistinguishable from each other. However, I bring that scathing article up because in that, Reggie Rucker was one of the few men who received praise, as the article called Rucker very bright. Rucker wasn't like everyone else, as he said that lots of other analysts were apologists for mediocre players, and Rucker wasn't having it. He said, everybody's not great. Everybody's not brilliant. I like to separate the thoroughbreds from the plow horses early on. If you're a player who's afraid to play and I'm the analyst, 
I detect it very early on. This style received praise for many. The reviews were in, and Rucker was a rising star who was able to get himself an increased workload for the 1984 season because of it. And one of those games was in Week 8 on October 21st, 1984, when the 1-6 Cleveland Browns traveled to Cincinnati to take on the 1-6 Bengals in an in-state rivalry game. Of the more than 20,000 games played in the history of the NFL, this was definitely one of them. The Bengals won this game 12-9 in a game where not a single touchdown was scored, as all 21 points came off of 7 field goals. This game would have historical significance in the immediate aftermath, as Sam Brutigliano was relieved of his duties as head coach of the Browns and was replaced by Marty Schottenheimer following the loss. However, on the Bengals' side, the big story from this game wouldn't be what happened on the field, but rather what happened off of it in the announcing booth. Because during the broadcast, Reggie Rucker said something that would rile up head coach Sam Weish and bring about one of the strangest controversies in NFL television history. I need to emphasize just how much Rucker was loved before what happened here. Rucker was somewhat of a natural in the broadcasting world, and in the eyes of a lot of television executives, it was rare to see someone make the switch so naturally from playing career to commentating like Rucker did. After retirement, he learned under the guidance of Sidney Andorn, who was somewhat of a local legend in Cleveland in the television and radio scene. He hosted multiple television and radio shows, was a color commentator for the Cleveland Indians in Major League Baseball, got hired immediately after auditioning for NBC in May 1983, and executives and columnists loved what they saw. He was moving up the ranks, and there seemed to be nothing that could stop him. Which is what makes what happened here all the more bizarre. During the 1984 season, the Bengals traded running back Pete Johnson to the San Diego Chargers in exchange for James Brooks. Many Bengals fans consider this trade to be the best that team has ever made in their over 50-year history, and rightfully so. Brooks played eight seasons in Cincinnati, made four Pro Bowls, was an instrumental part in Cincy's offense when they made it to Super Bowl 23, and finished his career as the all-time leader in franchise history in rushing yards, though Corey Dillon would eventually break that record a decade later. However, when Brooks was starting out in 1984, he was not good at all. Entering that game against the Browns, Brooks had just 66 rushing yards on 36 carries, averaging a mere 1.8 yards per carry, and he seemed to be doing worse in the offense as time went on as over his last four games, he had 14 carries for 10 yards, averaging 0.7 yards per carry. He wasn't getting touches, he wasn't playing well, and didn't seem to have a good grasp of the offense. That's when Rucker went on the air during the game and talked about Brooks' struggles. He talked about how Weish didn't have a lot of confidence in the newly acquired Brooks, and how Weish told him firsthand that he was disappointed with Brooks because he just couldn't get a handle on the playbook. Apparently, the night before the game, Rucker had dinner with Weish, and Weish told him this information. That's a great piece of information to bring up on the air. It's good insight, it shows that you're asking the right questions, that the coach trusts you enough that he's willing to divulge this information that could be said in front of millions of people, and it's very relevant to the situation at hand. The only problem? Yeah, none of that ever happened. Rucker didn't have dinner with Weish, and everything Rucker just said, he completely made up. And safe to say, Sam Weish was absolutely furious. Weish had no idea about the comments after the game because obviously, he wasn't listening to the broadcast while coaching the game, and none of the reporters brought it up because they weren't listening either. But eventually that night, when Weish got home, he learned about what Rucker said on the air. He was baffled as to why Rucker would not only make up something that Weish never said, but would make up the fact that the two men had dinner together. And this wasn't one of those things where one person thinks it's a date and the other doesn't think it's a date or something like that. No, it was very clear that Weish did not, under any circumstances, have dinner with Rucker before the game. When Weish got into the team facility on Monday, he ripped a new one into Rucker, and that's putting it mildly. Weish said on the now-disgraced announcer, Reggie Rucker is a blatant liar. I've spoken to him maybe twice in my life. Reggie Rucker is somewhere approaching mediocrity in what he does. And when Rucker was caught in this lie, he knew he was completely screwed. He admitted that everything was a lie, and that he didn't have dinner with Weish, although he did interview him for 90 seconds in a pregame thing. On-field contractually obligated interview that takes less than two minutes, dinner, yeah, that's the same thing. Once NBC confirmed the fact that Rucker made all this up, they were incredibly disappointed. They didn't fire him or suspend him, but officials said that they would watch him a little more carefully, and put a greater scrutiny on him. Executive producer Michael Wiseman said that the fallout from this was punishment enough, saying, I think that Reggie has been hurt in two ways. His reputation and credibility have been dealt a blow, and I think that's damage enough to Reggie. Wiseman said that Rucker was embarrassed about all of this, and that even though there was no further punishment, that this incident was a clear black mark on his career and that NBC won't allow for something like this to happen again. Even though Rucker would escape further punishment, the damage was done. His broadcasting career was ruined. Rucker would get a reduced workload the rest of the way, and would no longer be paired alongside Phil Stone for the remainder of the 1984 season. Rucker was relegated on the depth chart, 
and most of the games he worked involved the Cleveland Browns, who are one of the worst teams in football, taking on some low-level competition like the Houston Oilers, Buffalo Bills, and Atlanta Falcons, all of whom would finish among the bottom of the league. In other words, Rucker was now working meaningless games that no one really cared about. And it seemed like Rucker learned his lesson. He called it a stupid mistake and his way of trying to do too much, saying the dinner thing was just a fashionable way to introduce the material. But not anymore. Not since my thing. I found out there's never any excuse to not be 100% accurate in the broadcast business. Sam Weish was later a really good sport about the whole incident. In week two of the 1985 season, Rucker was put on a broadcast team between the Bengals and the St. Louis Cardinals. When Rucker called up Weish to come to a production meeting, Weish suggested that the two men meet for dinner. However, while Rucker was ready to move on, and while Weish was ready to move on, the damage had been done in the eyes of the public, as Rucker would never move up the announcing depth chart on NBC after that. What seemed like a surefire ascent to the top went completely stagnant, as Rucker continuously got bottom of the barrel games until he stopped calling games for the network after the 1988 season. The saying that it takes years and years to create a reputation and only one moment to destroy it has never been truer than it was when talking about the reputation and broadcasting career of Reggie Rucker. He was loved by executives and was supposedly the next big thing in broadcasting. And it all came crashing down because of a dinner that never happened. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, subscribe down below if you haven't already as it helps the channel out a lot, and be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9pm Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at Jaguar Gear 9 and subscribe to 60 Second NFL History on YouTube. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters who help get the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.